You boys be quiet down there! Welcome back. In this series, we're reviewing every Neo Geo game in order, and this time we're looking at NGH 014, Mutation Nation, 1992 from SNK. As per usual, I'll be playing this on my MBS cartridge, shown here. The year is 20XX, and in case the large capital letters on the screen in the intro don't make things crystal clear for you, the city has become a slum. A crazy scientist guy, whose name we are never told, was conducting some weird genetic experiments, which resulted in an explosion. After the explosion, some kind of virus began spreading around the buildings in that area of the city. As it turns out, the scientist is not dead, and it's up to local fighters Ricky Jones and Johnny Hart to stop him. And that's basically all we're told. A simple premise with a wealth of possibilities for wild enemy designs. The game was produced by the founder of SNK, Eikichi Kawasaki, with music by frequent SNK composer Masahiko Hataya, who goes by the alias Papaya. So we're in good hands here. And by the way, all these folks on SNK Tokyo team, you can hope next their game. As I mentioned in the previous video, Mutation Nation began its life as Dream Over. It was the working title of what was originally intended to be SNK's first side-scrolling brawler on the Neo Geo. Who are you? Yes, yes, Ninja Combat was indeed the first brawler on the system, but it was designed by Alpha Denchi, while Dream Over was developed by SNK. Anyhow, the game suffered delays and as a result, every other brawler that was being worked on at the time made it out the door before it did. Sengoku, Burning Fight, and Robo Army by SNK skipped ahead of it. Don't forget me! Get out of here, Legend of Success Joe. No one wants to talk about you. <laughs> Meanwhile, as Dream Over waited in the wings in the early 90s, the side-scrolling Double Dragon-style brawler category began to lose steam in arcades as it was being replaced by the one-on-one -on -one Street Fighter-style fighters. Revenue trends shifted and arcade operators adjusted to it. The demand for these side-scrolling brawlers dwindled. The Double Dragon party was over. Dream Over was indefinitely postponed and was in danger of being lost forever. Luckily, in 1992, someone at SNK decided to revisit it, change the name to Mutation Nation, and released it anyway. And other than Sengoku 2, which also barely made it out the door a year later, the side-scrolling brawler was completely retired from the Neo Geo, but with only one exception, Sengoku 3, which was developed eight years later. The English version of the instruction manual for Mutation Nation was actually compiled by the marketing department before the game was finished, as is often the case with games. And as such, the words dream and nightmare can be found throughout the manual, including the exact phrase dream over in the game's story outline. So it looks like Mutation Nation was in danger of being forgotten in the trash heap, but fortunately the game was finally released to consumers in 1992. One unanswered question that remains about this game is how much of it is from 1990 and how much is from later on. At only 54 megs, the size of Mutation Nation is relatively low by 1992 standards, which would seem to indicate that the majority of the game is from earlier in the development timeline. However, once in a while the enemy designs and graphic details seem to suggest that the game is newer. It's very likely that at least some small graphic touches were added just prior to release. On the other hand, it's also quite possible that development was simply an ongoing process that spanned two to three years, as other projects took priority. For all we know, the majority of the work was done during the final stretch. Here's a video showing a prototype version of Mutation Nation at the 1992 Japan AOU Amusement Machine Operators Union Expo. This was filmed on February 26, 1992. The cartridge label here says Mutation Nation in Japanese, not Dream Over. This shows a very feature complete version of the game that we ended up getting, including the sound effects and music. Well, now that you know the story of the game's perilous trip to market, let's get to playing everyone's favorite non-CDI based mutant themed brawler. 
Since Mutation Nation was released in 1992, unlike launch titles on the system, at the beginning of the game we get a difficulty select screen. Like most games on the Neo Geo, you are limited to 4 credits in the home version, and the Unibios doesn't have a cheat built in for unlimited continues. So if you have a Unibios and you want unlimited continues, you'll want to play the game in MBS mode. I'll show you how we used to do shit back in my day. We didn't have any fancy Unibioses or consoleized MVSs. <coughs> when we used up all four credits and got game over, we had to save to the memory card and then load the beginning of the stage. If playing alone, sometimes maybe we switched over to the two-player controller port mid-game to get more credits. It went on like this, saving and loading each stage until we reached the end of the game. You just needed to be good enough to finish each stage with four credits. And you'd better be careful in this game, because you get only one life per continue. And although you have a good sized life bar, a few mistakes will suck that health away fast. Don't let the enemies get the upper hand. The simplicity of the controls in Mutation Nation is a plus. There are only two buttons, attack and jump. Additionally, there are five different charge attacks you can perform by holding down the attack button including the Torneado attack, apparently. The items you pick up throughout the game determine the type of special attack. Besides the visuals, the differences between these attacks is negligible, so I won't bother going into the details of them. If you run out of special items, you can still do a basic charge attack, during which you can move around the screen, but you can't do this when you're low on life. Speaking of that, don't forget to pick up those attack items. They also refill a small amount of health. Under the right conditions, if you continue pressing attack, you can sometimes juggle enemies with combos for a nice finisher. In the negative column, you can grab enemies, but you cannot throw them in this game, so most of your attacks are limited to simple melees. There are also no weapons to pick up. At least punching and kicking the crap out of enemies in this game sure is fun, which is the most important part of any brawler. All six stages have mini-bosses, which is an enjoyable feature. Characters in this game sometimes scale in from the background, just like in Burning Fight. You'll want to save most of your special attacks for the bosses and mini-bosses in this game. For example, this first stage mini-boss attacks along with two dog-like creatures. You've usually got just enough time to charge one up before they attack, so that way you can quickly dispatch the dogs before the amount of enemies on screen becomes difficult to manage. The first stage boss has multiple phases and spans two floors as you drop down for the second phase. Like most of the bosses in the game, this one is fairly easily dispatched with some well-placed dodges and rounds of attacks. These days it's easy to forget how impressive the size of this boss would have been back in the early 90s. The Neo Geo really was known for its large characters. Stage 2 has these characters who run out and lob their exploding heads onto the screen, running away soon after. This is the first of several enemies in this game that simply come onto the screen, do their one thing, and then quickly go away. All of these types of enemies can be dispatched with one hit, so these exploding head things aren't too bad as long as you avoid the explosions in the center of the screen. This big Arnold Schwarzenegger mini-boss attacks with electricity. Just avoid his series of attacks and wait for your chance to counter. I knew it! It's Arnold! Get out. These motorcycle riders in the back section of Stage 2 are the bane of my existence. In most beat-em-ups, it's loads of fun to knock enemies off their bikes with a well-timed jump kick. That's what you'd expect you have to do, but here in Mutation Nation, jump kicking never works. Instead, if you want to beat these riders, you must stand your ground and punch. It takes guts to try it and it often still doesn't work. I've only seen the riders felled a small handful of times. The vast majority of times, you'll simply get run over if you try to attack these things. So I don't even bother trying anymore, and do my best to avoid them whenever they come onto the screen. The only problem with that is usually they attack in a pattern that leaves very little safe real estate on the screen. This disco lady at the end of stage 2 shoots bees or some kind of flying bugs at you. The bees, or the dogs with bees in their mouth, and when they bark, they shoot bees at you? It's a good idea to use a charge attack at the beginning of the fight to remove all the bees from the screen. 
Stage 3 keeps things interesting, dropping you onto a series of long flatbed semi-trailers. Some enemies jump off of bikes into the action. Luckily, you don't need to attack these ones. This stage introduces another of this game's annoyances, and this one I love to hate, the giant flying bee enemies. Those aren't bees! They're bees o bandits! Bees hose away! These things must be dispatched with air attacks until they land. If you can manage to get in the zone and line yourself up just right with their shadow and land a well-timed jump kick, you can knock these things out of the sky. So satisfying. This is providing that there aren't too many other enemies on the screen harassing you, of course. It's frustrating because the timing is so strict that I seem to miss more often than not. Urgh, I just managed to do this a second ago. But these trucks can't go on forever, right? The developers had to come up with a way to get the players from one truck to the next, and they basically picked the laziest way possible. Ricky and Johnny can apparently do this super moon jump. I guess they could do that all along, but it wouldn't really be useful if you could do it during gameplay. By the way, that's some aggressive graffiti there on the door of all these trucks. Kill you? Someone must have been super pissed off when they painted that and wanted to make sure everyone knew. Stage 4 continues the tradition of one-hit drive-by enemies, introducing more bee-like creatures. Fortunately, these things don't really seem to do anything other than run through the screen. They aren't too difficult to stop. I wonder if that enemy is going to come down from the wall. I'll bet it is. Well, that was somewhat anticlimactic. The stage 4 boss isn't too bad, as long as you move up or down to avoid whichever part of the screen it's going to land in when it's on the ceiling, and then wait for it to stop flashing before unleashing your attacks. The game still isn't finished introducing new one-hit enemies in stage 5 with these creatures that shoot their toxic smell clouds onto the screen. I think it's B.O. <laughs> All of this is fine with me. I'll take anything over the cheap, quick deaths of the final stages in Ninja Combat. The boss of Stage 5 seems to be projecting a second instance of itself floating around the screen. Or there are two different people, I'm not sure. The game's manual doesn't seem to want to spoil the later enemies in the game. The one with rocks or something spinning around it is invincible, so you have to focus your attacks on the blue one floating closer to the floor. Most of the bosses in the game are a pushover, but this one can be frustrating, mostly because it has a habit of eventually cornering you on the edge of the screen, and there's not a lot you can do to get out of it. If not for this, the blue one would be very vulnerable. The sixth and final stage of the game is strictly a boss rush. Yeah, I know, kind of a letdown, though admittedly the game design does put a lot of emphasis on the bosses but the total game time for one playthrough still averages around 30 minutes, and I think I like the backgrounds for this stage the best. That's because the final stage takes place in the Mad Scientist Tower, and each boss fight is on a different floor, beginning in the basement parking garage. Each of these areas is wrecked. Something happened here. The past destruction of the environments in the building is a highlight of the background art in my opinion. The final boss fight against the mad scientist at the top of the tower is a pushover. He transforms into this giant alien-inspired mutant with blades for arms. Get away from her, you bitch! And he has a face protruding from his stomach. That is his stomach. Now I'd like to talk just briefly about the Neo Geo CD version of Mutation Nation, released in 1995. I know the original game was released in 1992, but if you were hoping for an arranged soundtrack for the CD release, I've got bad news. Not so for you. The full game loads in 57 seconds. You'll never need to load again. And as far as the game itself is concerned, everything is here. There are no differences. Unlike the cartridge version, the CD gives you unlimited continues, which is normal for Neo Geo CD releases. The only noticeable changes relate to accessing the CD audio music during the game. For example, upon clearing a stage, there's now a delay before the boss music stops and the stage clear jingle is played.
You can kind of see why they would decide to do this. They let all of the letters fly onto the screen before freezing the game and accessing the music track. You end up with a musical sting right when the score tally pops onto the screen. Of course, like in many Neo Geo CD games, music access times lead to some awkward pauses during the gameplay not present in the cartridge version. Most notably before and after a mini boss fight. I'm of the mind that it would be better not to freeze the gameplay and to just let the disk drive's laser lens get there whenever it gets there. But it seems SNK usually wanted to play it safe and not allow game scenes to play out without background music, in case the system runs into unexpected trouble reading the disc. The last example of a change is the elevator scenes between the bosses on the final stage. These scenes have no music in the cartridge version of the game. But in the Neo Geo CD version, I think they wisely chose not to turn the music off. This of course spoils the suspense building mood of the cartridge version, but probably saves on disc access time. Considering the amount this stage is broken up, it's probably a good trade-off. Speaking of the game's music, it's pretty great. That first stage theme really sticks with you. and most of the other stages will probably grow on you over time. The boss themes are also memorable. That familiar Neo Geo rock guitar sound is always welcome as far as I'm concerned. As with everything in this game, I do have to wonder how much of the music is from 1990 and what is from 1992. Again, the game is only 54 megs, and the music doesn't use many samples, leading me to believe it was finished earlier. Also, if the music was complete earlier in the process, it doesn't make sense to me that the sound designer, Masahiko Hataya, would have gone back and made more changes later. It's more likely that the music was finished and then used later without modification. This all leads me to believe that the soundtrack is of an earlier era, albeit a good era. The Stage 3 music reminds me of Joe's theme from Fatal Fury 3. But in case you were thinking it's because these two games have the same composer, you'd be wrong, since that isn't the case. The similarity is likely just coincidental. And that's Mutation Nation. Is it fantastic? No. Is it good? Yes. In fact, it's kind of an overlooked gem on the Neo Geo. It feels a little less half-baked than the previously released Robo Army. It certainly is enjoyable to beat up enemies with the tight controls in this game. Thank you for watching another one of Neo Alex Neo Geo reviews. I already talked about NGH 015 in the last video. It's an unknown, unreleased game. So next time we'll be jumping ahead and looking at NGH 016, King of the Monsters. Please don't hesitate to like, comment, and subscribe to Basement Brothers to stay up to date with new videos. Or don't, you make the call.